I'm gonna say the long-winded version because I feel like that's the most inclusive. It incorporates everybody because Asia is massive and the diaspora is massive as well. So May is Asian Pacific Islander They See American Heritage Awareness Month. It is also Mental Health Awareness Month, which is an interesting combination because APETA folks don't really, historically and presently to a degree, unfortunately, don't really recognize or prioritize or address at all uh, their mental health. And we are getting better. We are talking about it more, but I think that there is still a lot of work to do, particularly among older folks, older members of the community, um, people who are immigrants or more recent immigrants, sometimes second generation kids of immigrants because they've adopted the cultural thinking of their parents and were raised to also not prioritize it, and uh, male identifying community members because a plethora of reasons that stem from just our culture not really thinking it's valid, let alone real, to have anything wrong with your brain because it is an American myth to justify laziness and having too much free time because they were too busy working and grinding to ever even think about or acknowledge the trauma or pain that they endured to make it in America. Or wherever they were coming from, that's just not a practice anyways. So if they're processing it or even having these conversations in their 50s and 60s, I don't entirely blame them because it is such a new concept and they, if they're retiring or if their lives are slowing down a little bit and now they're processing things that happened to them as a kid or when they were in their 20s and immigrating, it's a lot. And if your brain has existed for 55 years already, you know, there's even more to unlearn and work through. The more time that has passed where you didn't address your mental health, the harder it is to kind of dial back and start doing that. So it's important to have patience and empathy when it comes to talking to our older community members. Um, male identifying community members may consider it a feminine priority to discuss it or have mental health issues. Um, and if it's feminine and if it's too westernized, uh, it's inherently weak. But what I find to be weak is just arrogance and deliberately not taking care of yourself. I find that to be pretty detrimental. Strong people want to take care of themselves. Strong people will do what it takes and have the conversations to take care of themselves and their community members who might also be suffering. So just some context on myself. My name is Billy. I have been talking about mental health concerns and the need to have these conversations in the Desi community specifically for a while now. Uh, I'm 25, but I, when I was 18, when I was diagnosed with a depression and anxiety disorder. Um, I had made a three-part YouTube video vlog series that may or may not still be on YouTube. Depends on if I like want to hear my voice back then. Um, that kind of documented pre-diagnosis, what the diagnosis, diagnosis process was like, and uh, life after diagnosis. 18-year-old Billy is in the past for me, but I think that she made a lot of good points and I respect her vulnerability. So if you want to check that out, you totally can. But that's where I'm coming from as someone who has been navigating and talking about mental health concerns for years now. I'm kind of, I am the first and so far only person in my family who talks about it, makes art about it, writes about it. Um, and I don't, I don't really want to consider myself a pioneer because it doesn't really feel like a fun journey, but it is an important journey and I am more than happy and willing to talk about something more specific that I think is even less discussed and less understood amongst not just the APETA community, but, um, just in general, I think in America, just because of how it's spoken about and casually thrown into conversation and that is OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. For me, that manifested out of having an anxiety disorder, which manifested out of years of mental health negligence and unresolved trauma that, you know, is an ongoing thing to work through. But OCD can exist separately, or it can be kind of a tangential disorder alongside having anxiety or depression. But because so many of the triggers are anxiety related or stress induced. That's kind of where the relation for me 
comes from. So yeah, I mentioned that the way that it's been casually thrown into conversation has been partially responsible for some of the misunderstanding of what it is and what it looks like. You may have heard it colloquially and irresponsibly, might I add, be referenced by people when they are expressing that they have particular taste in something or preferences or they need things to be done a certain way and if they aren't they will get stressed out or antsy or irritated and you'll hear phrases like sorry I'm super OCD about this or my OCD is going to act up really bad if I don't get to do this or if it doesn't look like this um and that's to explain that that's to explain away kind of like fidgety um antsy behavior that someone might be exhibiting and it's just kind of a slang term to say like oh my god I'm gonna be so OCD if like my keys don't go specifically there um and I think that that's an oversimplification and also kind of an inconsiderate use of the term because obsessive compulsive disorder is a psychological disorder that when left unmanaged has debilitating consequences on your daily ability to function it gets in the way of so much and it's not this like quirky casual um idiosyncrasy that the average person has because we all have preferences and we all might get a little bit irritated when things don't go our way but that doesn't mean we have OCD because if someone got irritated when they didn't get what they want or they didn't get it a specific way you could be describing a toddler you could be describing like a brat you could be describing a director or a dictator like there's so many people that it applies to so let's not overgeneralize and self-diagnose because that's irresponsible reckless and creates a lack of empathy for people who do suffer from the real thing because the real thing is really frustrating at least for me it has been i've been working on it and i want to talk a little bit about what my journey to understanding it has been and managing it has been so when i was 18 if you have or have not watched that video or don't already know I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder, which are so broad and you could have so many other things going on beneath those umbrella terms. Um, Cause underneath that is like panic disorders and sleep disorders. And there's just so much else going on. But um, the way that I got diagnosed was a 30 minute conversation where I filled out a survey that literally had me rank how often and how badly I think about dying which is like in general I'm just like mortality is fascinating but I guess like it was just a red flag that I was 18 and like really really curious about death um so I got a Zoloft prescription within like 45 minutes and that really messed with my internal chemistry because at 18 your brain isn't fully developed and that was a really intense drug to take and then wean myself off because I was like no this is making things worse and as a consequence of that, I lost a lot of trust in doctors and in the diagnosis process because I felt like they were just pimped out by big pharma and pumping drugs into vulnerable people to make some money, which, you know, is sadly, as I've done even more research, more and more true than it is false. But I would say around 23, 24 is when I started doing more research and having more professional medical conversations to understand some other symptoms that were coming related to my anxiety and that's when I got diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder the behaviors that I was describing that were symptomatic of OCD were a lot of repetitive and obsessive compulsions so those are the two qualifiers of OCD is the obsessive part and the compulsive part. An obsession is something that takes up a lot of mental space in your head to the point where not much else can fit in there and you're making decisions based off of that point of obsession. You're, you're thinking about it and you're operating from that place. Um, not a place of rationale, not a place of logic, just a place of quelling that obsession. The compulsive part so a compulsion is just the irresistible urge to do something and it's the action part so obsessive is the thinking compulsive is the doing and the main thing to think about when you have OCD is that you are seeking control you have these intrusive obsessive thoughts and the urge to do something about them when you feel like you don't have control so for me because I was very very anxious and that came out of just years of 
mental health negligence, honestly. Um, did not have those conversations, did not acknowledge or prioritize anything relating to my mind um, and unresolved trauma. So that came out in my behavior as a lot of repetitive rituals that were supposed to make me feel calm. Um, for me specifically, and everybody has specific rituals, it's not like if someone does something a lot that's definitely OCD and if everybody who has OCD does the same repetitive behaviors. No, it's just repetitive rituals oftentimes that are done a particular way and they get in the way of your life. And that can be a variety of things and everybody has who has OCD might be doing something different. Uh, for me, that was the way I would leave my bedroom to go outside, like to go outside of the house or outside of my apartment. I would have to touch certain things in a certain order and say certain things and count to a specific number. And if I didn't do it or if I feel like I got distracted, I would have to repeat it. Even if I was running late and even if I felt angry with myself for not stopping and having to repeat it, um, it was like I was fighting my own brain and I would repeat it anyways. However many times it took for me to feel like, okay, you did a good job. Now you can move on. Now nothing bad will happen. Um, so it would be like touching, counting, saying certain things, thinking certain things, and then that's how I would leave a room. If I was physically leaving like my house or the apartment building I was in, I would have to check and lock my door a certain amount of times, count and say and think of certain things as I was doing that. And I would unlock and lock my door again over and over and over until I feel like I did the ritual correctly and I didn't get distracted. And... It didn't matter if I was already in my car and a mile down the street or if I had made it down five flights of stairs and started walking to the subway. Um, I would go back knowing I was already late, knowing that it's locked and things are secure and I'm going to be fine and, you know, I'm not going to die today and my family and my friends are going to be okay. Um, nothing catastrophic is going to happen if I don't do this ritual. I knew that. Logically, I knew that. But... I it, it's that's what that's where the debilitating part comes in is that logic didn't matter so I would go back I would do it again I would I would like literally just grunt in frustration and I, I ugh, it was like two, being two different people in one body and being mad at the person that kept doing these stupid rituals and I think in my early 20s the first few jobs that I had I lied to my boss about why I was running late because it just seemed embarrassing and crazy to explain that it was my OCD doing it and it wasn't registered as like a disability or something that like hindered my ability to work even though at some point it was. Um, I lied to friends about why I was running late or I would go back upstairs while I was walking downstairs with someone to, from my apartment and just be like oh I think I forgot something and that would be like my justification for going back to check the door. Um, I've been late to so many first dates and made so many bad first impressions. I have irritated my partners because I've been late so many times. So once my morning or exit rituals were done, it still came out in ticks throughout the day. So that it can look, like I said, it can look differently for a lot of different people. It's not necessarily just like, you know, your leg, the tapping your foot or your leg shaking or, you know, biting your nails for me. It was scalp picking and that was really hard to hide because I just, it's something you can see me doing. I'm not really doing it in this video, but if I was in class or at work or just like sitting and had a moment of free time to think and my mind would wander to some negative thought. Um, the thing about OCD was I was always thinking like, if I don't do this and something bad happens, that, that could be coincidental. It's not going to be coincidental. It'll, it'll be because I didn't do my ritual. It'll be because I didn't touch or count or repeat or lock or something the way that I should have. And so that's what I associated with. And I, I put so much responsibility for negative things that were happening out of my control on myself. And it was just, it was all about control. And there were some things I wasn't going to get control over, but I still needed to feel like I had control. And so throughout the day, if I wasn't checking doors or touching things in my house, I was obviously outside and I just had ticks. And for me, that was scalp picking. I was always either playing with my hair, adjusting my bangs, or literally just like like picking at my skin in my scalp. Um, some people do it like on their hands or arms. Um, 
and I thought that I was being more subtle by having it be my literal head that everybody could see but um this is referred this is called so the scalp picking disorder is actually called dermatillomania which can occur as its own issue or as a symptom of OCD like it can be kind of like a satellite problem I would say its main symptom is just the irresistible urge like I said compulsion to pick at a specific part of your body over and over and over again um that's the obsessive part um as a means to relieve stress or anxiety and it's it can be a form of self-harm if you're just thinking that if you can exert pain and just channel it to a certain part of your body um that can just be the substitute for what you're thinking about and what you're actually feeling um and i i think it did get to that point for me when it was really bad because i just needed that distraction and needed that activity to just get my mind off of something and just to feel like i was sending that energy somewhere else and i would literally just like my my skin would be bleeding and i would like rip out parts of my skin um and i would stop because i'd be like okay like I, i've obviously like gone super far but like that would be like what i needed to do to feel relieved of stress and there is even when you know that you're hurting yourself and you know that people might be watching it just makes you do it more sometimes and i knew that i wasn't being normal or reasonable and that was just like a constant fight against my own brain to stop you know rattling the doorknob and stop going back to my room stop picking at your head in public people are staring i was like yelling at my brain constantly and just fighting it all the time and i lost that fight so many times another tick that i had when i was a lot younger and through conversations was revealed to be like a premature kind of indication of ocd was uh nail biting and nail biting can be like anybody's nervous tick like anybody can do it and it wouldn't necessarily be indicative of, of ocd but uh for me it i did it in specific situations and around specific people and it would get to the to, to the point where I had chewed it, my nails down to the nub, but I was still doing it if I felt unsafe or anxious and it didn't me didn't matter that I was bleeding or that my hands looked ugly and damaged. I would just keep doing it and and I remember a relative who was actually somewhat linked to behaviors I exhibited when I felt unsafe and nervous um had threatened me to stop biting my nails which did not help and probably made it a lot worse and I don't know sent me on some other path of other activities I could do that wouldn't get me in trouble um at least not from what that person could see me doing um and threats don't work threatening someone to stop a tick don't work yeah, it makes it worse and it upsets them more uh, don't do that especially not to kids but my mom she gave a really creative alternative and i think that it serves me to always have creative alternatives just as an artist like that's such a great way for me to process so she would set like goals for me to grow my nails out like her her nails are naturally very long and both of us always get asked if these are our real nails they are um they grow out pretty long and we always keep them painted for me specifically whether they are long or short you will never see them not painted and it's because like you don't want to chew nail polish you don't want to get the chip in your mouth um it's not hygienic to do it anyways but especially not with the taste of like acetone or nail polish like that was a really good way to detract me and i also just liked seeing the progress of like how pretty my nails were getting and how long they were getting and just constantly getting compliments on them so i feel like that was just a good way to derail the tick and just turn it into just an aesthetic decision um, cause that's what it seems like these days. Like this is just my attempt at femininity. Um, but it really initially was a response to, uh, having a really, really bad tick, uh, a really bad fidgety behavior. And I, whether they're long or short, like I said, they stay painted. Um, I haven't chewed my nails and I don't even know how long and I'm super glad I haven't, but I never really want to risk going back there so even when they're short 
they grow back really fast but even when they're short I at the very least will keep them painted. Fun fact about me this isn't about femininity or being pretty or whatever it's uh it's so I don't relapse <laughs> my nail biting problem which is weird because you would think this would be really tempting right but it's not because it's so pretty I don't want to mess with it never got a manicure never needed one and so self-awareness really helps self-awareness is great it's a muscle to build and flex constantly um the more I became aware of the things that I was doing and the impact that it was having on just my time management, how professional I was being, um, how good of a friend I was being, uh, how honest I was being, I just, I, I needed to start looking inward and recognizing what are my triggers? When am I doing it the most? Who am I around when I feel the need to do it the most? Um, what is happening the day where I feel like I need to do my rituals even more? Um, and so just being aware of my triggers, whether they are people or places or events coming up near me, whatever, um, it was important to know that about myself to just be the, the starting point of managing it. There is no cure for it, but you can just mitigate how bad it gets and how many things it gets in the way of, I guess. And like I said, I'm the first and only person in my family who really talks about things like this and it started for me with just pushing those really uncomfortable conversations for the first time with people that I trusted to hear me and that was my mom and my little brother and I think that they got really educated and just gained some empathy just through having those conversations and maybe even learning a little bit about themselves and I you know started branching out to more family members and just making mental health conversations more of a normal and consistent thing that if anyone was going to bring it up it was me like i will be that relative who's just like constantly talking about psychology sociology politics whatever like all the things that you're not supposed to talk about um so i i took the risk of just further isolating myself as the black sheep and just being like you know what i have depression and i have ocd and i have anxiety and this is how it impacts me and this is how you can help me and this is why i did the thing that i just did and i'm working on it and yes I was judged and looked at weird in the beginning and it made things really hard but now I'm 25 and I think that I've matured a little bit and I or a lot of it hopefully um I'm better at having those conversations I'm better at not taking things personally and communicating my needs setting boundaries that comes with time that comes with practice I got vulnerable with my friends and my partners and roommates about things that made me feel safe at home and the reason why I did certain things and it was amazing because I realized that keeping it a secret was really harmful to me because it made me nervous to have to keep a secret like that and it would make me distracted and have to do my rituals even more um, and repeat them over and over because I was like oh my god did someone see me like I didn't really put my whole heart into this ritual because someone probably saw me so I probably wasn't really focused um but my friends would just be waiting really patiently in the stairwell and be like and I, I appreciated that so much. They didn't make me feel crazy. They didn't make me feel um, embarrassing or irrational, even if that's how I felt. Um, they were just really patient and empathetic and they asked questions and um, you have to extend trust to people in your life and you have to believe that you've picked people who you love and who have the capacity to empathize with you um, and want to know how they can support you and because I picked people like that and because I have family members like that um, I'm very openly living with OCD and I, I've reduced a lot of my repetitive behaviors um, still working on a few of them but they become so much smaller in terms of being speed bumps and obstacles because I'm not doing that extra work and adding that additional stress of hiding it and being ashamed of it um, I'm working on the things that are happening underneath the surface of why I have these triggers and why I have these repetitive behaviors. Um, I'm avoiding or facing and acknowledging the people and the situations that the disorder grew out of, which is also really difficult, but I feel so much more equipped because I'm talking about it. I'm removing shame from it. I have so many don't cry. I have so many great people in my life who are not making me feel 
bad for being in pain? Where did the tears come from? I cried in that video when I was 18 too, when I'm talking about depression, but um, these are like happy tears because I feel like I've, ooh, I feel like I've grown so much. And um, I'm like so much healthier and happier. And I just feel so much more capable Ugh, and the ultimate goal, I feel so much more in control, but also like accepting of the things that I can't control and capable of being positive and logical and solutions oriented and just forward thinking despite setbacks and despite things that are out of my control. And that's not something that even seems possible when you're in like the thick of it, the thick of having OCD and not doing anything about it. You're just like, nope, just gonna let this take over my day. For me, it's like I knew the things that I was thinking and doing weren't rooted in reality. And for me, I was like, that's a big red flag. You should probably address that. If this sounded freakishly relatable, I think the absolute best thing you can do if you think you might have it is do a lot of research and don't go straight into medication. Um, take some time. Have the conversations first with whoever you need to have the conversations with. Um, journal a lot. Develop self-awareness. Um, if you do have it, tell people that you trust and love. Don't do it alone because that's really stressful. That makes it worse. Build a community of support. Being secretive and alone is not healthy whether or not you have OCD. You just don't keep things that are hard to yourself because um, you're making the journey much harder for yourself. And I don't know, just trust that you have the right people in your life and that you made a good call and who you built a family and community with um chosen or otherwise to to give them the context to better support you um and if you don't have it just be patient listen do your own research this could apply to so many people but um peter folks specifically don't exacerbate your own suffering man it is not fun the other side even if you still have the disorders because you probably will they don't just go away um it's so much better it's so much easier life is so much lighter do that um yeah didn't expect to cry but i did so fun fact i do have emotions to those of you who have ever questioned that so basically a PETA folks and everyone in general don't invalidate mental health concerns make it a priority it's a real and valid priority and don't oversimplify the disorder as something that you have don't self-diagnose and if you do have it don't keep it to yourself boom i hope that was helpful that was the more concise version but i needed to cry for dramatic effect anyways goodbye